Good morning and welcome to the Carnegie Council. Today our speaker is Thomas Duvall and he will be discussing his book, The Caucuses, an introduction. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I wanna thank you all for joining us. Today our discussion is about an area that we often hear about but know so very little, the caucuses. Despite a combined population of only 15 million or so, you might be wondering why this small region of the world matters. The answer can be found, <coughs> excuse me, with one word, and that word is geography. Thomas Duvall, who is a world expert on the Caucasus, will introduce us to the southern republics of Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. These three small nations, which are perched next to Turkey, north of Iran, and south of Russia, are often referred to as the lands in between. Bounded by the Black and Caspian Seas, Europe and Asia, Russia and the Middle East, these nations throughout history have been a tipping point, for it is here where empires have met and clashed. This area came into prominence during a long, long slow conquest by Imperial Russia in the 19th century and was made famous by the poetry of Pushkin and the fiction of Tolstoy. Yet it is usually dismissed as too internecine and complicated to merit widespread geopolitical attention. However, with the end of the Soviet era in 1991, the Southern Caucasus have attracted much more attention than its rest of Northern counterparts of Chechnya, Dagestan, and Ingushia. Today, its importance lies as a region that is crucial for its existing oil and gas pipelines, as well as those planned for the future. These pipelines can supply Europe while bypassing Russia and go a long way towards explaining why the Caucasus are now such a critical theater in the Russia face-off with the West. In the Caucasus, Mr. Duvall explains the roots of present-day relations and competing national aspiration. He paints a picture of a region at the global crosswords, caught between democracy and dictatorship in immense oil and gas reserves. Because of its unique juxtaposition, it is easy to understand why this is a zone of intense Russian interest and Western concern. Accordingly, this book will serve as a much needed introduction to a region of growing importance. Now to familiarize us with these republics and the issues that put the Southern Caucasus in the news, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our guest, Thomas DeWall. Thank you so much for coming up from Washington to be with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Very glad to be with you from, although you can tell by my accent, I'm from slightly further away than Washington. Um, it's not such a, a long trip to make it up to New York uh, and be in our cousin institution. I'm, I'm currently with the, the Carnegie Endowment uh, in, in Washington. And um, it's, uh, this, this part of the world has fascinated me uh, for many years, and I think it is a fascinating example of of globalization, the way that events in small and rather from um, our perspective, rather obscure places can suddenly impact on, on, on the wider world. Um, uh, for years I would sort of go into, let's say a small village in, in somewhere like South Ossetia and people would say to me, so what does George Bush really think about South Ossetia? And I would have to say, <laughs> um, well, um, not a lot probably, but, but maybe he should have thought a bit more, because in, in 2008, South Ossetia was the uh, arena for the worst, as, as you know, the worst clash between uh, Moscow and, and Washington um, since the end of the Cold War. So um, the Caucasus, ha for better and, and mainly for worse, has, has been an arena of kind of great power uh, contact and conflict. Um, and it does, it, it is useful um, to know a bit more about it and to think about the ways in which those chains of connections that reach up from the, that small village in South Ossetia to the, to the White House can be made more positive and, and not lead to, to more conflict. Um, let me just start with a little uh, geographical sketch for you because we should have brought a map, but, uh, or I should have projected a map, but, but, uh, but I didn't. Um, so think of the Black Sea on the left, as it were, on the map, and, and the Caspian Sea on the right. Think of the Caucasus Mountains to the north, which define uh, this region and which are the the highest mountains in Europe, higher than the Alps. Um, and you have, south of those countries, you have, south of those mountains, you have three countries. Um, think of also three, I like to have a little scheme of three and three and three. You've got Russia, 
to the north, um, Turkey to the southwest, Iran uh, to the southeast. Um, that's the, the three big neighbors. Uh, in the middle, you've got Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, the three sovereign countries. And in, in the middle, you have three breakaway non-sovereign territories, which are, uh, have basically broken away from their parent countries, um, but have not achieved independence, which are the source of conflict. That's Abkhazia on the Black Sea, South Ossetia in the mountains of the Caucasus, and Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So think of that three in three in three. Um, now, why should we... Um, one day, I hope we'll be interested in this region because of its very ancient and rich culture. Um, it's a great archaeological treasure trove. It's got wonderful music, uh, wonderful cooking, um, amazing archaic customs which su survive in interesting fashions. Um, it's the home of wine. It's got the oldest archaeological evidence of winemaking in the world. One day I hope we'll be interested in this region for that reason. Unfortunately, it forces a <laughs> itself on our attention, mainly nowadays, for, for, for bad reasons, uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, and unfortunately, um, this region, the South Caucasus, has become synonymous uh, with conflict. Um, conflict and threat. Um, and in this regard, I think it's instructive to um, compare it to the Balkans, which is another um, region which um, we all think of as sort of intractable, complex, multi-ethnic. Um, and I think um, when you do the Caucasus, you discover that the Balkans is, 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 is one of those regions which is actually, and, and, and you, you see why we're in trouble, sets so a positive example. Um, <laughs> because um, actually the number of ethnic groups is smaller um, and there is a roadmap for the Caucasus, a kind of political, um, geopolitical roadmap, and that's um, the road to Europe. Um, and th the fact that there was this massive, if rather belated intervention in, in the late 90s in, in the Balkans by both Europe um, and the US um, was a signal that um, outside powers could no longer tolerate this kind of conflict. Um, and Europe obviously took the lead because this was Europe's backyard. Now compare this to the Caucasus, and I think the Caucasus is um, strength, but mainly its weakness, it, it's nobody's backyard. Um, it's, um, it's as, as Joanne said, the lands in between. Um, everyone cares about it a bit, but no one cares about it enough. Um, even Russia, I would say, and I can, I'll get back to Russia um, in a bit. So if you compare the fact that, um, look at Kosovo or Bosnia, um, tens of thousands of NATO troops, um, billions of, of dollars poured into stabilizing those conflicts, and then reflect on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, a conflict many of you probably don't spend much time thinking about. Um, and yet, I would argue that critically, strategically, that's actually in a more strategically sensitive location um, than Kosovo. Um, this was a conflict that started in 1988 between Ar Armenians and Azerbaijanis, right back during the Soviet era, way before conflict was even talked about in the Balkans. It escalated over this disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenian majority, but inside the territory of, of Soviet Azerbaijan, escalated into full-scale war with the collapse of the Soviet Union, turned into an intrastate conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, ended in a ceasefire in 1994 with the Armenians basically in control of the land. Um, and we don't hear much about it because that ceasefire has basically held since 1994, but the Azerbaijanis did not accept um, that their land um, is now under Armenian control. They say, it, it, they say it's ours. Um, and reflect on the fact, um, reflect occasionally on the fact that um, when you're reflecting on many things in the world, that there is a hundred line, hundred mile line of contact or ceasefire line um, running through the territory of Azerbaijan. There's about 20,000 troops on either side. There are trenches there, sometimes only 50 or 100 yards apart with two armies on either side. And there are just six European monitors monitoring this ceasefire. Um, and um, they make twice monthly spot checks on this line of contact. But basically, if either side, and we're probably talking about Azerbaijan because it was the losing side, um, wants to go back to war, they can. Um, and now, now let me tell you 
remind you that we have Iran to the south, Turkey to the southwest, Russia to the north, Georgia also vulnerable Georgia to the north, and also two big oil and gas pipelines running from the Caspian Sea, which run about 10 miles to the north of that ceasefire line. So um, we shouldn't be complacent about um, these places. And I think South Ossetia in, in 2008 um, was a sign that, that we can't assume that because somewhere is at peace now, that peace will endure forever. So um, this is, is the zone of conflict. Um, and outsiders here, I think, um, have been rather unhelpful rather than the opposite. I would argue that, um, and I do make this argument in my book, that these ethnic groups actually have quite long histories of, of cooperation. Um, they do get along, that there are many conflicts that don't happen in this region. We shouldn't just regard this uh, as, a, as a zone where people are fated to fight with one another. Georgians and Ossetians, for example, are both Orthodox Christians. Um, they intermarried. Um, they, they traded with one another. Um, and it was very much a political and security problem that drove them apart, and one partly driven by outsiders, Ossetians looking to Moscow and Georgians increasingly looking to the west, a chain of alliances which drove these villages um, in these small, tiny villages of South Ossetia on either side of, of a geopolitical divide. Um, and this is where I think, um, unfortunately, the, the previous administration um, rather misjudged um, this region um, by over-engaging in Georgia. Um, Georgia's the most fascinating country. Um, it had the rather thrilling Rose Revolution, peace revolu peaceful revolution in in end of 2003, which brought a, a new young dynamic government to power led by the youngest leader in Europe, Mikhail Saakashvili. Um, and he did some, indeed did some promising reforms, but it was very much a work in progress. Um, and as far as I can see, um, the previous administration need, wanted Georgia to be rather successful than it actually was um, at that point. Um, George Bush came and stood on Liberty Square in, in Tbilisi in 2005 and made a speech saying that Georgia is a beacon of liberty, a model of democracy for the world, and if you walk, when you walk the path of freedom, you do not walk it alone, which was fine words. Um, he then moved on to his next stop, and this was you know, a model for his democratization project. But of course, if you're, if you're a Georgian and you hear those words, and you come back to someone like me and say, George Bush does care about us, you know? He just made a speech on Freedom Square saying we're the leading new democracy in the world. And, I, and compare that, and when you connect that to a kind of natural, rather um, spoilt feeling about the Georgians that they are the center of everything, um, you do have a dangerous, uh, a dangerous uh, combination in which suddenly foreign policy was completely oriented towards the United States. Russia was, was forgotten. Um, com a complete nobody, for example, was sent to be ambassador to Moscow. Um, and um, all the trips were, to, were, were west, some to the Europe, but particularly to the United States. Um, and of course, this um, in turn stoked the conflicts in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Russia manipulated those conflicts. Um, and in 2000, by 2008, we had a very dangerous situation. Um, I'm not at all underestimating the role of Vladimir Putin and the Russians in this. They certainly wanted a fight with Georgia. Um, but the, the rather reckless way in which the Georgian government um, es raised the stakes and also talked about how it had the support of Washington, um, I think, made things far more dangerous, um, such that um, when, um, and I write about this in, in great detail in my book, I think there was some sense in, in 2008 the Georgian government, when they attacked South Ossetia, that they would, um, certainly the US, they knew the US wouldn't approve, but they thought that maybe they had 24 hours in which they could get away with it. Um, and um, 24 hours later, their American allies would say, well, we didn't really approve of that, but okay, you've changed the situation on the ground and we're not going to condemn you. So a massive miscalculation on the Georgian side in 2008 which, as I say, then fed up to Moscow and Washington and caused this huge um, clash, latter-day Cold War clash. Um, when it comes to Europe, I would say that Europe, on the contrary, its problem has been that it's under-engaged in this region, but um, maybe we'll talk about that a bit later. 
a few misconceptions, um, and I think I see my role um, in this book and generally in my work to be a bit of a demystifier on this region. Um, it's not quite as frighteningly, frighteningly intractable as you think. Um, one, one misconception um, I think is important is the one of ancient hatreds. I, I certainly, um, you certainly hear this a, a lot, but uh, I do believe these conflicts are political conflicts. They're driven not by ethnicity or religion. Uh, Georgians and Azerbaij Georgians are Christians, and Az Azerbaijanis are Muslims, and they get along absolutely fine. So the fact that Armenians, who are also Christians, fight with Azerbaijanis is not, I think, an indication that this is a religious conflict. Um, I believe these, these conflicts were actually very much incubated in Soviet times um, when there was a lot of competition between different groups. As you know, the Soviet Union um, sort of based its territory on, on ethnicity, which in turn led to rivalry and competition um, for the favor of Moscow. And, and when Moscow then suddenly walked away um, at the end of the Soviet Union, these, these rivalries suddenly be became much more dangerous. So that's one um, misconception I would like to combat, that, that of ethnic and ancient hatreds. Another one is um, frozen conflicts. I think I've maybe I explained myself already quite well that, um, that um, South Ossetia was not a frozen conflict in, in 2008. Um, this was a thawing conflict, and, and therefore we should, we should not be complacent that these conflicts are frozen. So I try to ban the use of the word frozen when I'm, when I'm talking about these conflicts. These are simmering conflicts or smoldering conflicts, i.e. conflicts that we shouldn't just uh, forget about. The, the, these conflicts could rapidly rethaw. Another, and another misconception and cliche that I'd like to combat is, is the so-called great game. I don't know where this came from, but suddenly, um, somewhere in the mid to late, late 90s, suddenly people started pulling out copies of 19th century British magazines and saying, ah, Britain, Britain and Russia fought for the resources of Central Asia in the 19th century. This was the great game. Now we have a new great game in which the spoils are the countries of the Caucasus and Central Asia. Um, it was a tempting journalistic metaphor, but I think it was very dangerous because it implies, one, that th these countries are not agents and actors in themselves, that they're some kind of spoils to be either won or lost. Uh, it kind of takes away any agency uh, from these countries. And secondly, it casts Russia as the villain. Um, and Russia can be very villainous. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But I'm saying that Russia also um, can be constructive and cooperative. And, 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 um, um, and certainly, there are different Russias and many actors in Russia. But to cast Russia in the villain as the villain in that sense becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that, that, you're, that you're, you're saying Russia is our rival. And Russia is very good at being a rival and a competitor if you want it to be. But if, if we'd said, actually, we can cooperate in these places, we both have interests, um, that would have been far better. And, and unfortunately, this great game metaphor, I think it's been stamped out, and it comes back, and suddenly there's a new, a new book comes out. Uh, and then the other one I hate is, is, is the grand chessboard, again, implying that these countries are pawns being pushed around, and there's only one winner in the game. Um, I thought this had been stamped out, and then someone told me a new Swedish book is coming out called Georgia, a pawn in the new great game. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> oh no, it hasn't worked. I'm, I'm, but anyway, hopefully I'm, I'm leading the counterattack against these dangerous, dangerous metaphors. So I think this leads me to my final point, which is, which is the role of Russia. Um, and um, Russia is, is a big presence in my book, obviously. Um, and I say, like any colonial powers, um, I think it's, its record is a bit more mixed um, than it looks to outsiders. Um, and Russia is not all bad in this region. It sometimes can be very bad. Um, but also, I think the main thing I want to say is Russia is a bit weaker in this region uh, than it looks. Um, and um, um, if you can, I think Russia very much does regard those mountains, the, the Caucasus Mountains, as a barrier. That what's on the north side, they will never give up. Um, this is the North Caucasus, um, even despite its kind of wild and difficult and Islamic and prone to conflict. This is its southern flank. On the other side of, 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 the, of the border in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, they certainly have interests. They have historical interests. Um, but I think there's an acceptance by Russia that this is the wider world. Um, and they, they want interest here, but they, they do not necessarily seek to dominate. And they certainly nowadays accept that outside powers 
um, have a role here as well. And most importantly, they don't really have as many levers as it looks. Um, there are many former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Latvia, for example, where the, I mean, you know, up to a third or a half of the population is ethnic Russian, which obviously gives Russia uh, an interest in these places. In the South Caucasus, it's now less than 2% of, of the population is, is ethnic Russian. Um, if you look at military presence, um, there's now one military base in Armenia, and, and, and that's it. Um, Abkhazia is, is a bit of a, spe uh, a special case. Russia obviously has identified Abkhazia, which it now de facto controls as its zone of interest. That's a disputed province, so I, I put that to one side. But if we look at the rest of the region, I think Russia's role um, is a bit more weaker and pragmatic uh, than it looks. Um, so where does this, what does this lead me to say? I've done a rather a mad dash through this region, so I'll try and leave a lot of time for questions. But um, I've, I've been on record in Washington, raised a few eyebrows with this phrase, which is a bit of a a provocative phrase, um, saying that this, what this region needs is a dose of strategic insignificance. Um, now, and, and I'm, some people say, you're arguing yourself out of a job. Um, uh, um, but that's not quite, and I think John Lloyd, who wrote about it in the, in the um, maybe I was being, being, trying to be a bit too subtle, John Lloyd wrote about the book in the FT yesterday, and he gave me a nice review, but he talked about disengagement. I'm not talking about disengagement, I'm talking about disengagement on that kind of high geopolitical level, that kind of um, we're battling here with Russia. Um, I think what, what, what we should be looking and you know, that this is all about pipelines, all about um, NATO expansion, all about these big schemes, which I think actually don't deliver anything in the long run um, to the people of this region. Even, I would actually say, oil and gas pipelines have delivered them very little. Um, so I think the right kind of engagement is, is much longer term less glamorous, and it's all about institution building. It's all about actually building states, um, proper viable states uh, in this region, um, and um, from the bottom up, um, building institutions which really were paper thin in, in, in the past and, and need to be built up. Um, and then in, in that sense, actually, the most important capital for, for this region is not Moscow or Washington, it, it's Brussels um, that, that really um, this is the one, and um, it's going to be a slow process because they're quite a long way from European standards on democracy, on, on, on the economy. But Georgia in particular does have perspectives um, to harmonize with Europe. It's going to be a very long process. But I think um, that, um, and Europe does have interest in the stability of this region, which is, after all, I its neighborhood. So I, th I think on that rather dull note, I, I will end and say that what really... Um, the Georgians need is less glamour, less um, c fewer conversations with uh, Barack Obama and talk about NATO expansion, um, but and more conversations about um, trade quotas um, with various commissioners um, in Brussels. And, um, and of course, if we have no news from this region um, in the next few years, that's probably good news because it means and we've managed to stabilize it enough to avoid the conflict and let these countries slowly grow towards a, a better future. Thank you. It's a perfect introduction. Um, I'm sure there are many questions to follow up on your presentation. So I ask that you please introduce yourself and wait till the microphone comes to you, Susan. <coughs> Susan Gittelson, thank you for your very thoughtful and careful analysis. Uh, could you please expand on the economic uh, situation? You mentioned natural resources and uh, the, the uh, oil pipeline and so, so gas and so forth. Um, un undoubtedly, this always has a role. And secondly, uh, you uh, began by talking about the three important neighbors, mm -hmm. and yet uh, you spoke mainly about Russia. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we are familiar with Iran as an expansionist power, mm -hmm. um, looking forward to nuclear uh, threat to other people, and we know that they have been very active in the Middle East. What are they doing in the Caucasus? Mm -hmm. And, of course, 
Turkey mm -hmm. is not really a quiet power, uh, and it is going more assertive. And there are uh, presumably s some of the uh, Muslims mm -hmm. speak uh, Turkic mm -hmm. languages or whatever. So could you uh, mm -hmm. expand in these areas, please? Sure. Th uh, thank you for those um, two good questions. Um, the economic situation um, really is 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 quite bleak. Um, we all know that conflict um, has a devastating effect, um, n not just on the on the people who are directly affected, but on you know the country as a whole, and 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 primarily an economic effect. And I think the region um, is still still struggling to get over that. Compare if you look at the Baltic states. Um, I haven't got the precise figures, but I think. The Baltic states now per capita GDP per capita is something like twelve thousand um, dollars. In, in Georgia and Armenia, it's two thousand dollars. I mean, th these these countries were part of the same state twenty years ago. Azerbaijan, that's a bit higher, it's about four thousand dollars. But um, that's driven by oil and gas, um, which, as we know from other parts of the world, um, you know, tends to benefit five to ten percent of the population. Some of whom are now billionaires, but um, it provides few jobs, um, and in an authoritarian society, there's not much trickle-down effect, unfortunately, fr from that. Um, so, um, and besides the other problem that Azerbaijan has is that in five to ten years' time, its oil revenues will start to decline. It's hoping to, to get more money out of gas, but the whole gas picture in the world is very uncertain at the moment about with things like shale gas coming, coming on. Um, Iran, um, both Iran and Turkey, I think, are the sort of um, surprisingly absent from the region. Um, Iran, particularly, so um, both of these countries, you know, up until 1800, these were the two great powers in this region. Uh, but the Russians pretty much forced them out, um, and 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 the, and in a way turned this region um, towards Europe, ob albeit in a very Russian way. Um, but certainly, you know, the Azerbaijanis of Azerbaijan are kind of much more secularized, educated um, than the Azerbaijanis of Iran. There's quite a strong contrast there, which is all to do with, with the Russian-Soviet experience. Um, I think Iran basically has too many problems of its own to, 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 to actually exert much influence. It exerts a bit of negative influence on Azerbaijan, um, which has does because um, it... Um, for example, has a TV channel which broadcasts in the Azeri language, denouncing Azerbaijan as a kind of enemy of Islam and a friend of Israel and so on. Um, but it, it doesn't really have much influence. Um, the foreign minister has has tried this year to try and make some progress, but I, 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 th I see he was sacked yesterday. <laughs> um, um, Georgia, interestingly, has just, um, and this, again, slightly, if you, if, um, Georgia is, like to say, it's a friend of the U.S., but it, it does try and play all sides. Georgia's just instituted a visa-free regime with, with Iran. But I think that's mainly for economic uh, reasons. Uh, Turkey is definitely trying to um, uh, activate its policy in the Caucasus. Um, the, zero, you know, the famous zero problems with neighbors policy. Um, but in the Caucasus, I think it's, it's, it, hasn't, it basically couldn't decide whether... Zero problems with neighbours meant you treat all neighbours equally, or, or some neighbours are better than others, uh, and um, and that basically means Azerbaijan, which is a fellow Turkic country. Um, they 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 had this opening with Armenia, and then they sort of backed off um, because Azerbaijan w w was was so militantly against, and, and they decided we we can't, um, you know, alienate our our, our Turkic brothers. Um, so um, unfortunately, that that rapprochement has stalled. Um, so Turkey is the biggest economic player in the region, um, the biggest trading partner, but its political influence, I think, will be small until it has relations with all three countries and it's got to sort out its own Armenian issue, which is obviously a big historical issue, um, which I can talk more about, but I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Richard Valcourt, International Journal of Intelligence. Uh, following up on Dr. Gittleson's question regarding Iran, uh, the West uh, involved itself in the Balkans, uh, particularly in Bosnia, on the side of the Islamics, on the Muslims. 
and that was in conjunction with the Iranians. Now, to what extent should the West get itself involved in the Caucasus or anywhere else? Uh, should the Russians, uh, for instance, get uh, even tougher than they usually are against the Chechnyans or any other country uh, in the Caucasus? Well, I mean, um, when we look at the South Caucasus, there are two Christian nations, Georgia, Armenia, and, and one Muslim nation, Azerbaijan, but one Muslim nation which is rather on the Turkey model, quite secularized. Um, so I would say that um, the, the Islamic factor is relatively small in the South Caucasus. When you look at the North Caucasus, um, obviously the Islamic factor is much bigger. Um, um, but really, Russia is currently in, in, I would say, in a state of denial about the North Caucasus. It, it is um, um, pretty becoming ungovernable. Rates of violence are shooting up there again this year. Um, logically, Russia should be calling for some international assistance there, uh, particularly with the Sochi Olympics coming up in 2014. But um, but Russia pretty much keeps out any any um, Western involvement in that region. So even if the West did want to got, get involved, there's, there's no opening there. And, and arguably, Western powers should want to have at least some stake in, 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 in the North Caucasus because it is becoming a bit of a black hole at the moment. Um, I, I guess my, my uh, question, sorry, it's John, John Richardson. Um, my, my question really is about Russia and whether the whether Russia is really in decline in this region or not. Mm -hmm. And I've got three things are running through my mind. One is this Western historians talk about the, the Russians uh, def using everything to defend the Rus, which is Mother Russia. Mm. And that goes to your point about the Northern Caucasus. But the Russia, which is, I guess, everything else, exhausts them periodically and they have to go back to defend the Rus. And you've got this, Russia's been the largest military power in Europe since... Napoleonic times. Um, and then you've got people like Stalin and Beria were from Georgia. Mikoyan was from, I think uh, it was an Armenian. Others probably, I don't know about history. But th so there's a tremendous history of involvement there. What do you think is going to happen? Is the bear really going to go out of this or <coughs> is it going to come back? Well, I, I think whether it, uh, it likes it or not, Russia is in long-term strategic retreat from this, this region. Um, um, I think it has so many problems in the North Caucasus that I've already alluded to, um, that the idea that, that Russia could in some major way um, you know, spend resources on dominating the South Caucasus, I, I, just, I just don't think is, is feasible. You mentioned the largest army in, in Europe, but one of the, I think, the unseen um, aspects of, of Putin's Russia is, is big military reform and big reduction in the arm, armed forces, uh, big slimming down of the armed forces. Um, and south of the mountains, Russia is very much the economic player nowadays. It, it, um, again, an, another story that's not talked about is it still has major investments in Georgia, um, owns most of the Armenian <laughs> economy one way or another. So I think Russia, and I think that locks Russia into a much more pragmatic um, role in this region in which it it becomes a zone of stability. If in the 90s the Russian military was a big player, now it's much more Russian business. Um, you know, we don't necessarily like Russian business, but it, it, it's certainly a great improvement on, on, on the Russian military in that sense. So I think, um, and you mentioned Stalin, Beria, Mikoyan. This again is another theme of my book, is, is you know, the Russians have always, they've never run this, this region with their own ethnic Russians. They've always done it with Locals, and that means it's become, it's been a joint project, uh, a Russian Caucasian project, um, um, of which Stalin is, of course, the most fascinating example. Um, again, I write about this in the book that Stalin had this sort of triple identity. He was kind of one third proletarian, um, non national, one third Georgian, and one third Russian. And he kind of combined these, uh, these uh, all, all in one personality, and, and people have even sort of said that the Soviet Union was actually a kind of map of S Stalin's, that, that personality, one-third Russian, one-third non-Russian, and one-third proletarian. So I think the, the Caucasus, you know, will never be Russia, and, and, and probably w never was Russia. So um, um, I think that's, you know, which doesn't mean that we, we, we don't 
um, watch Russia closely there, particularly in places like Abkhazia, which I think is a bit of a special case. But, um, but um, you know, don't, I think we should again possibly exclude the bear metaphor from my, my long list of metaphors to be struck out on when writing about the Caucasus. Arlette Laurent, uh, thank you for a wonderful expose. Um, you've mentioned Russia quite a bit. Uh, is it possible to differentiate between, um, let's say, a little bit down the line, Med Medvedev's attitude towards the region and Putin's mm -hmm. attitude towards the region? Thank you. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, of course, um, we, um, you know, if we, our friends from the State Department don't read those leaks cables, but, uh, um, but um, you know, I feel obliged as a scholar to look at them. Um, and uh, um, there was a very interesting one from uh, Azerbaijan, the President Elham Aliyev, saying, I think using the metaphor, it, we have an Azeri saying, you don't boil two heads in one pot. <laughs> um, and he was referring to Medvedev and Putin, saying that this you know, this combination cannot last, and saying that he trusted Medvedev a, long, a lot more than Putin. And I, I, I think that, I think Medvedev is, is much more, he was, you know, used to be Mr. Gas, he's much more pragmatic, he thinks, in this region, of this region in terms of energy, uh, um, primarily. Um, he's been um, trying to mediate um, personally between the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis this year. So I think, yeah, Medvedev, is a lot more pragmatic. Um, Putin would, would take a harder line. But then I get back to what I've been talking about, that actually there are many, many constraints on, on, on Russia in this region. And even if Putin wants to take a harder line, actually he has far fewer instruments uh, at his disposal than, than, than we might think at first glance. Matthew Olson, you set aside Abkhazia a couple of times now. As yeah, a no, it's case. time to talk about Abkhazia, yes. And uh, you know, maybe, maybe you could throw in the difference between Abkhazia and South Ossetia mm -hmm. as well, because Russia was fairly vigorous, and I understand mm -hmm. still has a military presence. It's substantial. Yeah, um, I, I, I haven't mentioned them, and, and, and I should. The, the, these, I think um, these two provinces are obviously the, the, the biggest headache um, and um, in different ways. Um, South Ossetia is, if you look at the map, is, is very much inside the territory of Georgia, linked to Russia only by one tunnel. So, so certainly the, the Russian military presence there is a big headache for Georgia. Having said that, I've already mentioned that Ossetians and Russians on the ground actually used to get along absolutely fine. So I th and, and Ossetians um, did most of their business in, in Georgia. Um, and um, um, I think the S South Ossetian economy has suffered terribly since 2008. So I, I do see in the long term a deal being done over, over South Ossetia, which is a small uh, agricultural region. Um, no one takes seriously the idea that it will ever be a, an independent state. Um, that's an, a, a long-term perspective. Um, we're not gonna, it's not going to happen overnight, but I, I think there are reasons on the ground to think a deal will be done over South Ossetia. Abkhazia... Um, is a much bigger challenge. Um, it did have, it was its own Soviet Republic until 1931. Um, it has strong ties uh, to Russia. It occupies a nice bit of Black Sea coastline. Uh, I have a section in my book called Soviet Florida um, <laughs> about how Abkhazia was, was the kind of great, the Riviera for, for, for the Soviet Union. Um, and, and, you know, um, talk to any Russian and they've had at least one childhood vacation in Abkhazia, so it's, it means something to, to, to Russians. Um, and the Abkhaz themselves, even though they're actually not a majority in their republic, are much more fierce believers in, in, in independence than the Ossetians are. So I think Abkhazia, I don't see going back to, to, to Georgia in any proper way. I don't see it becoming independent either, necessarily, but I, I think a much more creative model of some kind of loose confederation will be the only future for Abkhazia. And I think we do have to accept that Russia has, um, you know, it's in contravention of international law, but um, these things happen, unfortunately, around the world. There's, there are, um, Ab Russia has identified Abkhazia as a place it does not want to 
let go. Um, it's um, um, and um, in a sense, um, having lost Crimea, it wanted another bit of Black Sea coast. That's putting it very crudely, but but there is something in that. Um, and um, so we, we will have to deal with, with the Russians in Abkhazia. Um, but the, the Abkhaz themselves, I was there about a month ago, um, you know, they, they say, why do we, why are you pushing us towards Russia? Why are you isolating us? Why, you know, um, you know, we tože ljudi, as the Russians say, we're, we're also people, um, and, and we would like to come and, you know, visit Europe, study in Europe if we're students and so on. Um, and unfortunately, the Georgians default policy at the moment I is to kind of isolate uh, Abkhazia and not let that happen and I think that's a battle which also has to be fought with the Georgians saying that it's in your interest as well to open up Abkhazia to the world and not just see it become annexed by by Russia any questions up on the balcony to make sure I don't miss anyone Yes, Alain Olivier, uh, thank you very much for your, your presentation. I'd be curious to, um, to have uh, your opinion on the um, domestic politics in Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. Uh, what drives the conversation? Is it a left-right, pro-anti-Russian cleavage? What, what drives the, uh, the political scene in those countries? Thank you. Um, wow, that's a very... Big question. Um, I think we're still seeing a kind of hangover from from Soviet days in a rather sort of feudal style of politics, where, whereby one group, as it were, captures power and 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 dominates it and sort of dominates the economy as well. Um, that's um, and obviously they they look towards. Uh, the West a bit. Um, they 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 have member of membership of some Western institutions like the Council of Europe and the OSCE. So they do not have fully authoritarian systems, but um, so they do tolerate things like a bit of free media, um, um, some elections, and so on. But th this is basically, unfortunately, the pattern. Um, so we can't really talk about left right in that in that context. It's all about competition for for resources. Uh, that's certainly the case in Azerbaijan, um, and, and um, a bit less so in Armenia. Ge Georgia's a bit more interesting. It's the most pluralistic of, of, of the three countries. Um, and what's interesting in Georgia is, is and um, again, this is one reason why um, the Georgians won a lot of friends in certain areas of Washington, is that they pursued this very libertarian economic policy uh, over the past few years, um, sort of, Cato Institute policies of sort of de massive deregulation, um, you know, pretty much sacking the entire police force and appointing it again, uh, minimum regulation um, uh, in order to in encourage in investment. So it's been quite a kind of right-wing um, economic libertarian policy. Um, and um, so, and, and yet, when you look at the opinion polls, um, Georgians and ask them what the main issue for them is. Georgians say jobs and unemployment. So unemployment is very high. So I, I, I see a bit of a collision coming there in Georgia in the next year or two that, that actually um, some kind of uh, left-wing party could actually pick up a lot of votes if, if, if it plays on, on, on that card and says actually we've enough of these libertarians. We want, um, you know, we want jobs for the masses. Susan Rudin, I want to know what kind of educational system do they have in the caucuses and um, what is their unemployment rate or is there such a thing as an unemployment rate? Sorry, what was the, the, the uh, unemployment? What, 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 what is their unemployment rate? Do mm. they have an unemployment problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, educational system, again, is very much left over from, from the Soviet era, um, um, you know, quite rigid, quite good on, 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 on science subjects, although that's been eroded because teachers' salaries are, are very low, unfortunately. Um, um, but, you know, education 
is still one of the one of the stronger points um, in this region, although um, undermined very much by a weak economy. Um, unemployment is 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 a very big uh, factor. I saw a, was looking at a survey yesterday, which said that the official uh, unemployment rate in Georgia is about 17 percent, which is high enough. But then, but then in in surveys, up to 70 percent of people describe themselves as um, underemployed or unemployed, which implies that, that, that only about 30% of people have a full-time job. And, um, and a lot of these people are farmers who, who you know, they, they basically live off subsist subsistence. They're not, they're, they're, they have no connection with the state at all. They're just, they're just living off what they can grow. So, so I think this is um, a huge problem. Um, and I think... Um, um, you know, economic policies from outside really need to, to start addressing this problem. Bill Rayford, you suggested an internal focus with specific reference to institution building and the civil service. Um, where, where are civil servants recruited? What kind of education do they have? And what international exposure do they have? Um, well, this is a huge, another huge problem. Um, is 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 um, these places? Uh, again, this is very much the Soviet legacy. Have you might describe it as a bureaucracy, but not a civil service. A bureaucracy, and if we, if those of you who know Russia, this is a, a class which which sort of um, ninety percent of them exist to go and sit at their desks and draw a salary and create problems for people rather than to actually. <laughs> Um, be public servants, um, um, uh, and um, when we're talking about civil service reform, it's possible that really you need to sort of scratch it out and, and start again, and look and, and look at some sort of you know um, really start again from the beginning. I do I do think this is um, a big problem. I was in Brussels recently, and and and, and the U people in, in the European Commission were saying you know this is, this has to be the the priority is you know. How can a how can you build a state without a, a proper public service? Uh, thank you, William Verdone. I don't recall the town, but there was a horrific uh, attack on a child's school. Uh, I think in 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 the area that you're talking about, mm -hmm. were you there, and were you, or did you go there? And are there any insights that we may have missed? Thank you. Um, yeah, you're talking about uh, Beslan in in 2004 in in North Ossetia, which is on the on the Russian side of the mountains. Um, I I did go there a few months afterwards. I wasn't there at the time. Yeah, we're talking about this. It was um, this horrific. Um, Incident where these Chechen, mainly Chechen gunmen, took over this school, um, and and when the um, killed a number of hostages, and then the, the, when the Russian special forces um, stormed the school, I think about three hundred people died, including ha half of them children. Um, so so yeah, it was one of the most hideous events in the last decade, really, uh, terrorist incidents. Um, so um, I think there's. You know, it, it it was to do, unfortunately, with with the horrible politics of 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 the North Caucasus, you know, about Russian repression and local reaction, and then how that became connected with kind of Islamist movements. Um, the Ossetians themselves are an interesting interesting case um, that these these are problems who have these are this kind of and and there's the, all these fascinating little ethnic groups in 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 the Caucasus. The Ossetians are. Um, not not Muslim. They're mainly Christian. Although when you actually talk to them, you discover that they're pretty much pagan. Most of them. They they all um, they have this <coughs> character. They say it's Saint George, but it's actually their own pagan god Wastogi. And I'm allowed to say his name because I'm a man. But women are not allowed to utter the name Wastogi. Um, and 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 you know, several times a year they go off to these o old shrines, which they say are Christian, but which don't have many Christian signs on them and slaughter animals and have big parties and th so <laughs> <coughs> um, and so they're sort of a bit set apart from from 
their Islamic neighbors in the North Caucasus, which was one reason, unfortunately, for, for being a target for Islamist uh, violence in Beslan. And yet they also have this conflict with Georgians um, in the South as well. So, so it's not an easy lot to be an Ossetian. It's one of these um, funny nationalities which seems to be kind of exist in a little bubble of its own. Thank you for being such a wonderful teacher, introducing mm. us to the caucus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.